This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Because of my strange accent, I thought that I will add a few uh, written uh, slides so you can see what I'm going to say about. So prehistoric uh, people moved. As they moved, they made the same stone tools wherever they were. Stone tools are basically the ones you use for kitchen equipment, cutting, uh, butchering, and so on, carpentry, whittling, making wooden tools, and so on, and some personal gear. So the way you do your stone tools is the same like language. From early age, you learn how to do it, and you keep the tradition. And I would like to point out that some of this tradition in the last 400,000 years, if not more, lasted for a very long time. And we have for this the archaeological evidence, because 80 to 40,000 years is not something from short from the moment of the Industrial Revolution to the, to, to the iPhone age or to the smartphones. It's much longer, and it, it takes a long time, and people keep their uh, traditions. And therefore, what we are going to look now is see how it works across Eurasia, and how because of this, because of these traditions, because they were kept, we can follow and trace the people. Stone tools don't change because climate change. Climate change causes extinction of people. And climate change doesn't cause necessarily any evidence for changing stone tools. The same is the environment. It doesn't matter what environment you are, you still need your kitchen, carpentry, carpentry and personal gear. So forget about environment and forget about climate change. So here. <laughs> Good. So here is one example. Uh, because I know Dmanisi pretty well, it was supposed to be the, the original conquest or this, of colonization of Eurasia used to be considered as the beginning of the Achillean culture. Nonsense. Dmanisi showed it, and I will not argue about the exact dates of this place, whether it is 1.78 or 1.77 or 1.8, or, and, and just remind you, the stone tools were the simplest core and flake industries. Nothing sophisticated and core and flake industries are the same equipment for which within a short time other people arrived in other places, sorry. In, in, so if you go from Dmanisi where you see reed fairing digging where they found the origin of uh, the original layers where the skulls are and, and the, the, the piece on the left side shows you where they are. We have come to the Achillean. It's a different period, but remember, the first Chinese, the first people in China, got with the same kind of core and flake industries. But there is no time to elaborate. Here we come to another problem, which is with the Achillean. So the Achillean is pretty well known from Africa. It's known from Western Europe, from Western Asia, and from India. It's not the Achillean, the early Achillean for sure, and the middle Achillean not known from Eastern Europe. Why? Can you explain it? Maybe the people there didn't read the book and they didn't know <laughs> that after core and flake industries, it's time to use some bifacial flaking. And bifacial flaking is done in China. And you can follow this in a paper we published in Annual Review of Anthropology this last year. So I'm not going to talk too much about it, just show you how the Achillean is getting out of Africa and Ubedia in the Jordan Valley, where I spent probably 15 years is a one good indication how you find in the different layers the same kind of stone tools. You have on the left side 
uh, some bifaces and trihedrals and peaks. You have in the middle a double uh, hendex because they didn't know hendex and normal hendex should have only one point, but it happens in history. And then you have the chopper and the spheroids. This is what you find in Obadia in every layer over a thickness of over 50 to 60 meters deep. And the, the next is the famous cleavers. And the famous cleavers are well known uh, basically from, from the Achillean of India. And India has plenty of these cleavers. And now they are finally dated to 1.5 million years ago. So we have a way of tying together both the out of Africa of the Achillean with the making of the cleavers in India. Good. So back to Israel for a minute. And what you see, we are dealing with the site of Gesher Blot Yaakov that perfectly dates to about 800,000 years ago. And as you see in the drawings, you have cleavers and hendexes. So the question is very simple. Is in, in Gesher Blot Yaakov, where you have the elephant uh, skull and you see the, the earliest fireplaces in more than one layer identified in the site, did the cleavers came from Africa, the making of the cleavers, as it is suggested on the map, or it is a reverse migration of cleaver makers from India back to the African direction, but just stopping in the Holy Land? So a question to think about. <laughs> now, modern humans, this is basically an evolutionary story of two parts. The fourth migration, in my counts, is modern humans according to the molecular and nuclear uh, genetic evidence on which you already heard a lot is somewhere 250, 200,000 years ago, including Homo kibish to school crafts and so on. And they could have emerged earlier, as you, show, as you saw already from the, the lecture of Ellison Brooks, and de definitely many of the African inventions that Ellison showed us very clearly, and also uh, Lynn Wadley in her lecture, already arrived. So the guys are arriving, colonizing Eurasia, in the same way that the early settlers of North America from Western Europe arrived with all these inventions were already made in Europe and they bring them to this continent. And of course, immediately they have an advantage over the local people. So no surprisingly, the story will be continued. Okay, so the people, the, the modern humans coming out of Africa and in a way like you heard from the lecture of Chris Springer, you have, uh, uh, and from Ellison, we have the, the Mousterian Industries in Mount Carmel. What you should remember is that within an area of no more than 2,000 uh, square kilometers in the Galilee and Mount Carmel in Israel, which is probably no more than a thousand or less than a thousand square miles, you have many caves with a good number of fossils. So the more you dig, the more you find. And in Taboon Cave, which has the, the, one of the longest sequences as a cave in, in the world, it's about 23 meters deep, and I'm not going to mention the bottom. At the top, you have in layer B, the Neanderthals, dated to 80 to 45,000 years. In layer C, the modern humans, there are no dates from this place uh, that are good ones, but we, ha we have plenty of dates from, from Kafze and other, and, and other places. And then before it, we have the Middle Paleolithic, the Mousterian, and we have no fossils. So, you can imagine that they were made by some kind of modern humans coming out of Africa. And this is the earliest one, is coming with this kind of uh, Levalois but blady industry. And again, this is the kind of industry you learn from your, from your childhood how to make. And these people who make these points go further away. So we see them in Mount Carmel. In the center, you see them in Uzbekistan. And intentionally, I jumped over a site I know pretty well from the Republic of Georgia, from the Caucasus. How far these people got into Central Asia, we don't know. We always assume that people were very successful and we never talk about extinction. And we also don't, when they colonized an area where people were already there, it's nice to talk interbreeding because this makes, make love no war. But sometimes you make war, no love, and you kill the locals. And this is one of the kind of, uh, relationship well known for between the groups of hunters and gatherers. Okay, so we go on. And these modern humans uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Mount Carmel, you have in school, you have the beads, you have the burials, the organized burials and so on. And you have the same in, in Kafze Cave, which you can see here with the several of these uh, 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 copies from uh, the different burials. And you have the combination sometimes. 
But then comes the story of the Neanderthals. And if you look at the different populations, because Eurasia is one continent, you can walk, it takes a little time, maybe riding bikes, it's easier. You can walk from west all the way to the east. So the Neanderthals were not these simple idiots who, who were able to make Levalua points. Everyone who can make a Levalua point is an intelligent guy, well-trained. And if you don't believe me, call my former student, Matthew Aaron in UK, and he will tell you that it takes more than a year to do real Levalua in, uh, industry by practicing it every, every day for six hours. Something that only a graduate student can do, of course. <laughs> So, so if we follow these industries and the fossils and the ancient DNA, they already arrived in the Altai Mountains around 70,000. And there is more than one, according to the artifacts, more than one group of uh, Neanderthals. Did they escape from the penetration of uh, modern humans? Or was it before these real modern humans came into the area? You can see on the map that they arrived in Iran. We have them in the Hormuz Straits possibly also all the way to Rajasthan. And if you ask me, they even managed to get from uh, knowing the Chinese material all the way to this place, northern Jilin province, which is next to North Korea. So let the Chinese dig more, and we will have Neanderthals in China, not only modern humans, pr prior to the arrival of modern humans. OK. One of the well-known Neanderthals by now is the Kebara Cave. You can see the skeleton, the burial and I will not uh, uh, go into the details. And then we come to the new migration of modern humans. And this is, again, not as just a sweeping story going through uh, Eurasia, but it is a very complicated st uh, story itself. Why? Because we relate the production of blade industries, which are much simpler and more like cottage industry when it comes to making stone tools, when you compare it to the Levalua, which you have to be an intelligent to do it. So not surprisingly, plastic industry came after uh, some other things that we did before. And what you can see here is that the blade industry go all the way to Alta Mountains. The blade industry go all the way to, to northern China, where you find industries of real upper paleolithic that if you take them from there, and I've seen them in my own eyes, and break them to either West Asia or even Europe, no one will, you will be able to say that they are Chinese. So modern humans managed to get there. However, the line that separates these blade industries and the current flake industries, which are part of East and South China, remains the same. There are claims for blade industries in India that goes back to 45,000, I think they are in press. Don't believe everything you read. So, in addition, the colonization of Australia did not take place straight from Africa. It was by, by industries or flake industries. I've seen it on my own eyes on silkrete, a very good material as it was shown before here to, to make blades. These people were not blade makers. They were making a different f current flake industry, much more like Southeast Asia and South, and South China. So they are probably the descendants of some complicated migration of modern humans into northern China and then into the south. OK. Now, to, to, to start the story again from the archaeology, we go back to Egypt, where the, the site of Taramsa show clearly the industry, which is known as the Nubian Mysterian, making a way for the blade in the early blade industries in the Levant, whether it is Xarakil, Boker Tachtit, or the Emir, and makes no difference. I think this, I suggested this in 2000. Now, more of the local guys who work there accept it. Around 45, 50,000 years ago, they move into the Levant, only later to the Caucasus, straight into Europe, all across Europe. And because they came as different groups, ident uh, uh, their identity was not the same. It's not like a mass migration, but a migration of different groups going all the way into Western Europe, not reaching everywhere. OK. And you can see some examples. The Bohunitian in the Czech Republic, which we published long ago with Jerzy Svoboda, and the material from Krakow, or the material from the Ulutsian, and so on. So there are different groups. And the work of Shara Bailey and Jean-Jacques Hublin clearly demonstrated that the teeth of these modern humans differ from one place to another, when you com especially when you compare them to the Neanderthal teeth, which much more keeping their unique character. 
So once we are dealing with different groups of people, they penetrate into the region, and what they do, they cause the, the retreat of the Neanderthals because they take the better areas, probably by using better hunting tools like uh, uh, bows and arrows and so on, all the inventions that came from, from Africa. The Neanderthals retreat to the north and they retreat to the south. And then uh, through different processes, including decrease in, fer in total fertility rate, etc., without going into the details, they slowly, slowly disappear. And the beginning of the Upper Paleolithic, and I will not go here in, de in details because it's still a controversial issue, the first culture of modern humans was the Chatel Peronia. It's not, in my humble view, not an acculturation of the Neanderthals. And the, the one that everyone accepts is the, the Orinacian, and you can see the Orinacian uh, uh, evidence on, on, on this uh, slide in front of you. And the Orinacian culture is a Western European, and they are, in a way, like the Americans. It's a, it's, a, it's a group that was mixed from different groups, became very strong, well united, uh, well equipped. And what happens to them? They keep expanding like all the others because expansion is in our genes. And each of us would like to have larger territory, better territory, and better life conditions. And these are the principles, I think, of human history. Okay. Then we, the Upper Paleolithic people, these modern humans, getting also to the Altai Mountains. And what we see, we see in the Nisova, the nice uh, body decorations, and I will not show you any of the uh, artifacts and so on. And in addition, the distribution of the blade industries go, as I mentioned briefly, all the way almost to Korea, and probably into Northern Korea later, but we don't have enough evidence. Uh, as I have seen uh, men mentioned from the Jilin uh, uh, province. And still, the area that is controlled by current flake industries remain the same. And some of these modern humans who are also makers of current flake industries, but a dif uh, some, somewhat different from the early lower Paleolithic or the mill Paleolithic of China, these are the people who invade into Australia. And it's not surprising because Australia, according to work of Birzel, Many years ago, Australia was colonized much more than one wave, and one of those waves in, during the Holocene, brought the blade baking into the Australian world. People like to expand. You cannot stop them, and this is what happened to modern humans. So now we go to China, when really modern humans reach the place. Once they reach the place, you have the modern human skulls from Upper Cave Zucotien, you have the, 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 the body decorations found in upper caves of Kutien and some of the bone tools that found in another cave, Xiaogushan, in northern China. So people in the north are there as well. And this was nicely supported now by new, by new genetic studies of the remains from Kenyuan Cave, ancient DNA. The bones were dated already in the past to 40,000. And you can see this publication from the PNAS, final conclusions for May 2013, because we can change our conclusion anytime, like we like. <laughs> the more we learn, the more we know, the more we redesign our conclusions. So what we have is the dispersal roots of modern humans can be traced archaeologically, but this takes time, careful archaeological fieldwork, detailed stone tools analysis by experts, and not by amateurs, and prompt reports. <laughs> The genetic evidence more easily obtained can and should motivate archaeologists to enhance fieldwork and careful dating. We can trace at least five major migrations before the Holocene, but probably there were more back migrations occurred, and we should try and identify them as well. Thank you all. Uh, today, there are four uh, recognized major uh, established uh, language families of Africa. There's the Niger Kordofanian, and you'll see I give a few samples of languages that belong to those families, languages that you might have heard of. There'd be many others you wouldn't have. Uh, Niger Kordofanian, uh, Nilo Saharan, Afroasiatic, and Khoisan. So four families, and nearly all of the um, well over 1,000 languages spoken in the 49 
continental countries of Africa today belong to one of those uh, families. Now, to say that languages belong uh, to a family is to say that, and we use this term, genetically related. And that means all the languages of the family descend from, they all evolved out of the, uh, a common, a single mother language. We call it a proto-language. And that language would have been spoken by a single community or a collection of closely related speech communities at some period uh, in the past. Now, just a note, the descent of languages is like the mitotic descent of single-celled organisms. A mother language, a proto-language, diverges into its daughter languages. It becomes its daughters. It doesn't go on existing alongside them. Uh, and you can see the, the, this sort of uh, little family tree or whatever model we might call it here. This model here shows initially the proto-language developing dialect differences. Then they'd be still mutually intelligible, and that's sort of represented by the overlapping lines, the overlapping uh, ovals. And then uh, as time goes on, the dialects become more different, and they become eventually distinct separate daughter languages. And this is a kind of process that can repeat again many times and has repeated many times in history. The daughter a daughter language itself may eventually become develop dialects and then split into languages. And as it diverges, it becomes, it, it leaves, it, was, it becomes therefore a proto-language and gives rise to other languages. Now, the existing language families of Africa, the four families that uh, account for nearly all of the African languages, does this mean that the four proto-languages of those families, uh, oh, sorry, another little point I need to bring out. All of those language families in Africa have relatively deep histories. Uh, as, as families go. The proto-language of each of these families was spoken no more recently than the close of the Pleistocene, probably no more recently than 13, 14, 15,000 years ago. Now, does that mean that the proto-languages of those four families were the only languages spoken in Africa uh, at the end, the close of the Pleistocene? Well, of course it doesn't. There would have been hundreds of other languages spoken uh, in Africa then, just as there are today. But over the long millennia since the end of the Pleistocene, uh, the speakers of those four families happened to have been the ones that mostly did the spreading out into new areas. And as they spread in new areas, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, they eventually spread over large parts the, and, and over uh, larger and larger parts of the continent. Now, as they gradually expanded into new territories, they incorporated eventually the people already living in those areas into their societies. And so as a result, the other languages that might have been spoken in the late Pleistocene in Africa uh, eventually passed out of use. They became extinct. Well, perhaps not uh, every one of them. There have been suggestions in recent years of uh, four languages that might uh, go back uh, separately, that s stand outside the major families, uh, two of them in West Africa, one in Ethiopia. And it's also been uh, proposed by uh, quite a number of uh, scholars think that Hadza shouldn't be included in the Khoisan language family, which uh, I would put it into, uh, and that it should be also understood as another separate line of earlier linguistic descent in the continent. There is now uh, a particular feature of how languages evolve that allows us to extract historical information from them. And it works like this. Uh, changes take place over time in how people pronounce the words of their language. Uh, you, can, you are familiar with this just by listening to people speak different uh, dialects of English. But here's the key point. These sound changes follow regular sound change rules. They operate according to regular sound change laws. And we can formulate these rules, and then we can use these rules to reconstruct back in time a lot of the lesser, greater portions of the lexicon of the words that would have been used 
back in the proto-language of this particular family we're looking at. So let me give you an example. Uh, give you an example of a regular sound change involving Spanish and English. English and Spanish belong to the Indo-European language family. They are daughter languages, descendants of Proto-Indo-European, the mother language of the Indo-European family. Now, in English, the original consonant that we reconstruct as a Proto-Indo-European, we'll just say P here, um, regularly became F. Spanish, on the other hand, maintained the pronunciation of P down to the present. So what I'm going to do is give you an English word, and, and you'll see how these cognates go. Yeah, it's got a P, doesn't it? Okay. Well, we're looking at one sound correspondence, not all the other ones in the word. Now, we think obviously of pescado, as I hear people saying too, but think of pes, which is the more direct cognate. Pescado is the cut one. It comes from pescar, to fish. Another one you can get quickly, right? And the preposition for? Yeah, both, both para and por come from the same ancient root word as English for. They just came through a little bit different sound change rule history. Ah, uh, yeah, people got that. Poco, good. Don't necessarily think of that. Poco has a suffix added to it. It's the po part that's the same as the English word. A few, so you also have to be able to take words apart. Now, these are examples, just one consonant, P, and just in one position, the beginning of a word. If a P might have occurred in some other part of the word, you might have a different regular sound change for it. So you have to look at all those sorts of details. And there are regular sound change rules that explain the vowels, the difference of vowels, outcomes, and the other consonants in the words. Uh, it can become quite a, a complex and involved matter, as you might imagine. Uh, so not something we can go on looking at more today. But once we discover, once we work out the sound change rules, we can do, as I mentioned before, we can begin to reconstruct something, of, of, of an approximation of what the original word would have been and what its meaning would have been in the proto-language. Here's how we reconstruct the root words that lie behind the proto-Indo-European words, that lie behind those cognate words that we have listed here on our on our scene, on our site here. It's not just words like this, though, that we can reconstruct. We can reconstruct words that tell us about the culture, about the ideas, about what people knew and believed. Uh, just to choose one example, uh, in each of the African language families, we can reconstruct words to their proto-languages that show that the people who spoke them knew of bows and arrows. And here are the materials from the four families. Uh, you might have a couple of consonants that look strange to you down in the Khoisan. Those are click consonants I'll have something to say about later. And you notice actually Khoisan, another piece of information, we have a word, we can reconstruct a word for arrow poison. So we know something about their technology, a particular thing that's likely not to show up in the archaeology. So reconstructing ancient lexicon can allow us oftentimes to reconstruct things in culture that maybe won't ever turn up in the material record. It adds to our knowledge. It's an additional independent source of information. But the, sort of the information from these four families each takes us back only uh, to the late Pleistocene. In the case of Khoisan, maybe a little older, maybe uh, 20,000 years ago, a little bit earlier than the other two, the other three families, I mean. But that still leaves us the question, how do we connect up back the previous 30 to 40,000 years back to, uh, say, the period when humankind began to move out from Africa across the rest of the world. Well, the four proposed remnant languages from the earlier periods, it's too bad they're so few. They might eventually give us a little information, but so far they haven't been uh, properly studied in that way. But there is another kind of evidence that's come out recently that's informative on the early evolution of human language. Uh, a recent systematic uh, study has shown that the dispersal of humans out of Africa was accompanied by uh, uh, a recurrent trend toward the simplification of the consonant systems. Uh, there are individual exceptions, languages which over the history developed a little more complicated consonant systems. But overall, the pattern has been that the farther human beings moved from Africa, the less complex uh, the uh, simpler their consonant sy systems 
tended to become. Uh, the most complicated consonant systems left today are in Africa. Uh, the simplest system of all, with just eight consonants, is in the Hawaiian language, spoken, noto notice, at the far end of the farthest end of human movement into the Pacific, as far as you could get from Africa. So even individual cases kind of back up that, that sort of insight that this particular article discovered, the writer of this article. Now, there is a reason why history should tend this way in consonant systems. First off, some kinds of consonants are easily recreated by new sound changes in a language. Uh, so you might get, have a cons consonant, a particular consonant, or a set of consonants that might get lost from the language in the course of its history. But centuries later, there might be new sound changes that would re recreate those sounds. And I'll give you an example here, recreating a lost consonant, uh, by looking at the Germanic branch of Indo-European, English as a Germanic language. In Proto-Germanic, the ancestral just the Germanic languages, the original, what we reconstruct as K in Indo-European, became H. So it looks like K is gone. But around, through somewhere in the same broad period of time, another sound change law operated that created new Ks in Proto-Germanic by changing earlier Indo-European G into K. So you have one sound change that might eliminate a particular consonant, but another sound change rule later on coming along and recreating, bringing that back into the language. But on the other hand, there are consonant systems, quite a few subsystems of consonants, categories of consonants, which once they are lost, do not get replaced or may be very hard to ever be recreated again. And uh, so one good instance uh, is the pharyngeal consonants. And so I'll give you a couple of examples from Arabic, which is a language very much characterized by pharyngeals. Uh, I'm going to use these two names, which you would recognize, Ahmed and Muhammad. So Ahmed and Muhammad. Do you hear that unusual H, at least to us, unusual if we're just English speakers, uh, H-like sound? It's not Ahmed, it's Ahmed. Well, this sound is pharyngeal because the locus of making the sound is at the top part of the throat, the pharynx. And so that's why the adjective uh, pharyngeal. Among consonant sub sort of categories of consonants in the world, this pharyngeal sounds are one of the categories that once they're lost, tend not to ever be recreated by later sound changes. They're gone from the system. So what happened as people moved outward from Africa is that if they did go through a sound change history where they dropped one of these systems, these subsystems that couldn't be recreated again, then that was never going to come back. And as people moved farther from Africa, that process apparently uh, was repeated. And so the result was that the farther you got from Africa, the fewer of these kinds of unusual, what we would think in English as unusual consonant subsystems, disappeared, and the, and the simpler the consonant systems became. Now, there is a particular category I want to bring our attention around now, too, of consonants that once lost uh, do not seem to be able to be recreated. And that is the click consonants. And the click consonants are especially notable. They're notable because they bring, one, they bring you around my concluding point here, but they're notable because their history may have something to tell us about the fundamental relationships among all the language families of the world. You've been to the zoo, perhaps. I mean, San Diego is certainly a good place to do this. And you might have encountered uh, the antelope called the kudu, kudu. There, I made it much better that time. Kudu. Well, you know it better as the kudu, of course. And you may have read to children a book about the blue mu, spelled G-N-U, of course. This is the mu. That's one of those click consonants. These uh, click consonants uh, are uh, the, these words got into English because they came from a Khoisan language. The Khoisan family has cliques. And uh, these words came from them. Now, as regular consonants, as regular sounds in words, uh, cliques are almost entirely restricted today to the Khoisan family as parts of real words. 
They do occur in a few Southern African languages and in one East African language that are not Khoisan because these languages borrowed words with the cliques and they kept the cliques in the words when they borrowed them. They adopted them from Khoisan languages. People, uh, so virtually outside of Khoisan, these sounds are not found anywhere else in the world, not as parts of regular words. We do in English do, you know, a disapproval sound. That's one of those click consonants. Or you might know for, at least in my folk imagery, that's to get a horse to move faster or something. Okay, those are just the consonant all by itself, not put in a word. So yeah, we can do those. But try putting, like I said, with kudu and put it in a word. Much harder. You've got to practice a long time. But that's just because we're not used to it. Children who grow up, European ancestry, whatever, if they grow up in that environment, they learn the clicks just as quickly as any of the local children do. Well, uh, if we look back at what we saw with this article, Quentin uh, Atkinson, that I gave a quick reference to earlier, the implication of his findings are that the most complicated consonant systems in human history would have been far back in time. They would have been the ancestral language. And click consonants, because of the unidirectionality of consonant, of consonant change, should have been in the consonant system of the earliest human language. But why? Only in the Khoisan language family today. Well, uh, late Russian linguist uh, Sergei Starostin and I came up uh, separately and then talked about it with each other with a conclusion about why this might be. And our conclusion, and this is wrapping up what I have to say, was that our proposal, not a conclusion, but our hypothesis, our proposal, was that the languages of the world today belong to just two deep, deep time macro families. Khoisan, uh, what we, what we pro proposed is that Khoisan is the last remaining representative today of one of those macro families. This was the macro family that spread across the southern parts of Africa its language retained clicks. The rest of the languages of the world belong to another big macro family, all the rest of the languages. This, the ancestral language of this family lost clicks. That gave us a parsimonious explanation, one period in history with a loss of clicks. And here's a representation for you of a family tree. You see a south, sort of southern half of Africa set of language families, all extinct except for Khoisan at the left, a north, a distributed African family, all the rest of the world, the other three African families, and all the rest of the languages of the world belonging to that family. <laughs> well, this is our closing thought. There are some significant parallels here because the division of human languages, if, they, if this hypothesis turns out to be correct, we have a, a <laughs> southern half of Africa with uh, a basic big division within humankind, and then the rest of Af humankind from northern Africa outward. This looks a bit like some recent ideas of how, where the deepest lines of genetic connection within the human uh, genetic ancestry are located, the same kind of division. And so I leave you with that thought. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak um, to Carter. Um, I'd like to begin, as I do in my adopted homeland, Australia, by acknowledging the native tribes who were once the sole owners of the land on which we are meeting. Archaeologists should always be mindful of and respectful about the indigenous people whose past we study. I've been asked to talk about stone tools and human cognition. I might have chosen a different topic if I'd been given free reign. But as it happens, last week I, I was in the field near Cloncurry and my Aboriginal friend Gordon Connolly took us to a quarry. Here we found these artefacts, which we may identify. I've marked them. They weren't actually marked like that in the field. Um, <laughs> which we may identify more or less as an Alderwan chopper, an Acherlian hand axe, a Lavalois core, a Mousterian scraper, and an upper Paleolithic blade. A classification that has its roots in the 19th century. And I wondered what we might make of that. The study of how stone tools contribute to the grand narrative of human evolution is dominated by that set of named industries, mostly known from studies in Western Europe and, uh, and um, Africa, and related to the types at this one quarry in Australia. Thinking about the application of these labels in Australia, 
opens up our understanding of the significance of stone tools for researching the, the evolution of cognition. The study of cognitive evolution must go beyond the artefact forms that allow these labels and classifications. So to develop this argument, my talk has four steps. We need a definition of cognition, or we will not know what we're talking about. Everyone thinks cognition happens in the brain, so we need to say something about brains. And if we're talking about the evolution of cognition, we need to talk about changes in brains. Then if we want to understand the evolutionary processes, we need to think about how human cognition is different from that of our common ancestor with other apes. And finally, we need to think about how cognitive changes can be inferred by understanding stone tools. I argue that the processes involved with stone tool making and use were one of the selective contexts in which cognition changed. And I've got to do all that in 18 minutes. <laughs> George Miller originally defined cognitive science as aiming to, quote, discover the representational and computational capacities of the human mind and their structural and functional realization in the human brain. Implicit in this definition is the understanding that we cannot understand the mind simply by looking at the brain. We need to look at representation, computation and function, not just at structure. Increasingly, there is an understanding that cognition is also a product of interactions of people with other people and between people and things. Brains do not fossilize. So any statement about structural and functional realization in the remote past is an inference from the fuzzy evidence preserved on the inside of the skull. Going beyond the surface of the brain, understanding the capacities of the human mind in the past depends on inferences about past behavior using direct evidence from the archaeological record or from arguments about mental processes derived from observation of modern apes and humans. All of which means that there has been a lot of development of theory, much of it contentious, about how to interpret the interactions between the mind and brain in the past. Let us begin with brains. Brain size is an unreliable guide to anything. That's why I'm concentrating on it. <laughs> and internal organization is more important. But I believe there is one important point about brain size. We need to consider the relation between brain size and body size. Big animals have big brains because they are big, not necessarily because they are somehow cognitively better. For technical reasons, the only way to get over the problems of the long-term interaction in hominins um, is to consider the pattern of changes over time in brain size, the darker colors on this graph, and body size, the paler colors. There were two major episodes of change. In the first, the range of brain sizes increased, apparently followed by an increase in the range of stature. There were later selection against brains smaller than 700 milliliters and stature below 1.4 uh, meters. I suggest that more of the early brain size increase is related to, was related to body size increase than is generally acknowledged, but the timing makes it a difficult argument. In the second episode, stature did not change very much, give or take a couple of basketball players, suggesting that this was not about bodies, but probably about the way in which the brain was organized and functioned. And the change at this time was also followed by a selection against brains smaller than 1,000 milliliters, generally. The flakes and cores of the earliest stone tools emerged during the earliest brain size stasis, and in different parts of the world, continued into the time of the second episode of stasis. They may be related somehow to removing the selection against large brains, perhaps through their role in the acquisition of high quality food. The flakes and cores of stone industries called Acherlian, the foundation stones of our knowledge of human antiquity, began sometime after the first expansion of range of brain size and around the time of the extinction of the small brained individuals and continued through the second episode of stasis. But they also occur in Australia. The one on the left is from Australia. First peopled after the end of the Acherlian from a region that never had an Acherlian. The Australian evidence demonstrates that the distinctive forms occur without being part of a tradition, and I would argue they have all over the world throughout that one and a half million years. And we need to be aware of equifinality as an explanation for stone artifact similarities. 
But you cannot simply juxtapose such evidence. Rather, we must attempt to discuss the theoretical framework in which the interactions took place. Now is the time to go to sleep. In archaeology, we are most familiar with the working memory model of mental functioning through the work of Coolidge and Wynne. Badley and Logie originally defined working memory as comprising those functional components of cognition that allow humans to comprehend and mentally represent their immediate environment, to retain information about their immediate past experience, to support the acquisition of new knowledge, to solve problems, and to formulate, relate, and act on current goals. They defined a multi-component working memory as having four subsystems, the phonological loop, the visuospatial sketch pad, the central executive, and an episodic buffer. A phonological loop is an essential component of the functioning of this model, and it is closely related to the use of language. But that begs the question of whether non-humans, which do not use language, could possibly have working memory as badly conceived it. But no one in this paradigm has developed a model of what cognitive function would be in a hominin before they had modern working memory or language. Barnard described a more complex conceptualization of human cognition, uh, that's the one on the right in case you hadn't worked that out, uh, involving nine subsystems that process different types of sensory sim stimuli but in rather, different way, uh, rather similar ways. This model can map onto the elements that characterized Badley's model, but it emphasizes the external connections of individual cognition and that there are separate elements of the central executive that, that process all information seen, heard, or felt in the body. The exciting thing about Barnard's model is that it permits understanding of the cognition of the last common ancestor and intervening hominins. The similarity of form of each of the subsystems in the model allows for the construction of models that account for monkey and for ape cognition. In apes, the linkage between the visual system and the effector system that controls limbs and other bodily functions seems to be controlled by a specialized subsystem that is something like hand-eye coordination. The sixth subsystem model would account for the difference between apes and monkeys, which only have five, particularly in achieving some tasks requiring bodily dexterity, and also in learning through imitation in a process Byrne has described as recognition of essential elements of actions through statistical generalization. The logic of the construction of these models of simpler cognitions also produces an argument about how the nine subsystem model emerged from a supposed six subsystem last common ancestor. This logic predicts that there must have been models with seven and eight subsystems which have only ever been exhibited by non-human hominins. And there, were and there are various consequent predictions about what the cognitive abilities of those hominins must have been. How might this relate to stone tools? Because that is what I was asked to talk about and I'm not straying much beyond that brief, however much I want to. We know that some other apes and at least one monkey species manipulate stones. The fact that gorillas are not known to and that the monkey is a South American species shows that stone tool use is a convergent behavior in monkeys and humans. Importantly, chimpanzees in the wild flake stone accidentally while cracking nuts, but they do not use the flakes or appear to notice them. Captive bonobos and an orangutan have been taught to make flakes by humans, uh, and they've also been taught to obtain rewards by cutting a string, or should I say severing a string. Only hum hominins appear to have had the natural ability to remove flakes from cores by the intentional application of aimed force. Untaught apes do not. Byrne has argued that apes have many of the necessary cognitive behaviors to do that, but not the ability for accurate aiming. If you get hit by when you go to the zoo, it's not because they're accurate, but just because you happen to notice it. <laughs> I argue that they also do not perceive a need for cutting. A team led by Byrne argued that for many implicit roles, called semantic roles in Fillmore's approach to language, there is a great similarity between humans and chimpanzees. For example, there is implicit agency when the chimpanzee Mike 
climbed a tree, just as there is when John opens a door. Similarly, the dative role can be seen when one chimpanzee grooms another, as well as when I give something to someone. The issue is whether the apes can extract meaning from these pr performances. One of my projects has been to suggest that the persistence or permanence of stone tools was part of the reason why hominins became differentiated uh, from other apes after the last common ancestor. The same semantic roles can also be found among the early hominins using stone tools. Making stone tools involves striking one stone with another, a hominin but not an ape behavior. In addition, six of these eight hominin examples leave a distinctive material product, a permanent product. Repetition of actions that leave similar material products provides the circumstances for the identification of statistical regularities among these actions and products, not only by us as archaeologists, but by the hominins themselves. I would argue that this was the selective context for hominins to, become, uh, to come to recognize the semantic value of such roles and hence to extract meaning in relation to them. The persistence of the products of the performance of roles impacted hominin cognition. I've also done the same analysis of mark making, the beginnings of picture making. It's possible to define the same roles, but for four of them, the role can only be defined in terms of the mental processes that are conceptually removed from the actions or rules. I've argued that this could only be explicitly represented by the ninth subsystem of Barnard's cognitive scheme. Various comparisons between ape and early hominin technology have emphasized the similarities, such as that between the digging stick and the termite wand. One comparison, this, this comparison uh, by Bill McGrew, uh, compared the, these two tools using Oswald's flawed methodolo methodology to suggest that the termiting wand of the chimpanzee, as being a single strand, could be compared to the Tasmanian digging stick, I would say, and also a medieval sword. But the digging stick requires a stone tool to cut and make it, and generally is embedded in a more complex technology of bags and nets, and often in ritual and mythology. So I think we can list differences between ape and hominin habitual stone use, uh, and I want to add one more. Moore's analysis of the reduction sequence used in Tasmania shows that uh, what elsewhere he has called the basic flake unit. Usable tools were made by the consequent sequential application of simple principles of flake removal. Most napping, most places of the world, most of the uh, hominin evolution has been of this type. But in the Hunter Valley of mainland Australia, and of course lots of other places as Lynn indicated, that bla basic flake unit was the beginning of a more complex process where cores were prepared, then subjected to heat treatment, and then flaked once more to produce more specialist products. These in turn were ultimately hafted, a process that also required the production of the haft and of gum. I use this example to illustrate a feature of stone making, stone tool making that resonates with some research in cognition, particularly in relation to working memory. Much of this research involved testing the ability to remember lists of numbers, making the task more complicated by distracting the attention of the person remembering the numbers um, with a list of words interspersed with them. I suggest that the initial ability to incorporate such tasks, sorry, such distractor tasks, test the extent of our ability to store things in working memory. I suggest that the initial ability to incorporate such tasks into a sequence when they, are com when they completely alter the focus of attention represents a new cognitive ability, one that you have if you've been able to follow my argument despite the distractions of the rock art images. The ability to retain the proposition of the task in memory while your attention is distracted is fundamental to human as opposed to other hominin uh, cognition. So we can add attention distraction, or rather retention despite distraction, to the list of cognitive features of stone tool use. We can attach dates to these cognitively significant events. 
The ultimate attention distraction retention tasks were the construction of watercraft that brought people to Australia, where either the craft had to be assembled from disparate materials present in different places, or it had to be made by hollowing out a tree trunk with hafted stone tools, in either case for use with nets in another place. Tentatively, I offer the following narrative. Cutting emerged about three and a half million years ago and probably represents the emergence of cognition beyond that of the last common ancestor. Napping is present by two and a half million years ago and represents a clear distinction from the abilities of the last common ancestor in recognition of the capacity of hominins to divide the core into separate usable entities and one of them having a further function related to third objects. I will speculate that this was also the stage at which the seventh subsystem emerged, um, separating the effector subsystem into separate systems relating the limbs on one hand and the articulators on the other, the, the talky bits. Vocal utterance under control separate from emotional states might have been possible at this stage. A further speculation suggests that these two novelties and their connection to meat acquisition and other enhanced food opportunities were associated with the relaxation of selection against large brains and subsequent increases in body, body size. Extension of napping to string together consequent flake removals followed from the emergence of napping and was probably part of the selective context for the emergence of the eighth cognitive no subsystem. This involved the cognitive extension of such consequent strings to combinations of vocal utterances. The cognitive leap to constructing tasks which involved attention distraction and retention was achieved by 150,000 years ago. This led in turn to the emergence of the ninth cognitive subsystem by which humans could imagine tools and tasks before they made them and, and create new opportunities that did not arise from the contingencies of their current actions. We can play the game of matching these stages with the classification of fossils with intriguing results, but I do not have time to go on uh, into that mercifully. <laughs> the next slide shows a human skeleton, so if this is problematic for you, please look away until the last slide. So the last twist of the story is as follows. The barriers to colonisation of the last new worlds of Australia and the North and hence the Americas were cognitive barriers. They were crossed as a result of the creative conceptualisation of solutions to the problem of water crossing and of survival in the North. Watercraft and sewn clothing both involved planning of activities long before their realisation, impossible without solving the problem of attention distraction. That was behavioural modernity. Us had really arrived. The skelly's going now. Thank you. <laughs>